So welcome everyone uh, to institutionalizing collaboration, small and rural perspectives. Um, this is the, the third uh, and four kind of community conversations that we're doing uh, is kind of the culmination of our um, uh, three year project funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services called HEAL uh, at the Library, uh, Healthy Eating and Active Living um, via co-developed uh, programs. Um, and I'm really thrilled uh, to uh, welcome today to the conversation um, uh, April April uh, Young uh, and Leah Wentworth, um, two library leaders uh, from K Kentucky and North Carolina that I had the opportunity to talk with um, as part of this project. Um, and just to kind of set the stage, um, this conversation today is really our attempt uh, to have uh, the virtual equivalent of those in-person conference sessions where you see um, people at kind of the front of the stage kind of sitting in those big comfy chairs and <laughs> talking amongst themselves. Um, so we, we hope that this will be kind of fun and informal and engaging. Um, and we also want you to feel like you can participate. We've set up this room so that everyone in the room can uh, turn on their microphone uh, if they wish to. Um, and so feel free to put uh, put thoughts uh, in the chat box. Um, we have uh, Jordan Stackhouse, uh, a graduate student here at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro working with me. Jordan will we'll keep track of any questions that you put in um, to make sure that we, we uh, incorporate them into the conversation. Uh, you can also raise your hand, um, uh, especially towards the latter part of the event. Uh, and, and like I said, actually unmute. Um, uh, but without further ado, uh, let's let's jump right into this uh, important conversation. Um, so I want to introduce you to Leah Wentworth and April Young. Um, Leah Wentworth uh, is the Adult Services Manager uh, at McCracken County Public Library uh, in Paducah, Kentucky. Kentucky. She has done library programming for youth uh, and adults, uh, both in the library and out in the community for 14 years. Um, her focus areas include community partnerships, uh, underserved populations, uh, inclusion and well-being. And in her spare time, she's an organic vegetable farmer. Uh, welcome, Leah. Uh, April Young has worked for almost 20 years in the library field in North Carolina. Uh, she is currently the library director of the Rutherford County Library System. Uh, she has worked in periodical, circulation, children's, teen, and adult services. Um, she's got a community-focused librarian uh, who believes in an approach to open approach to library services, meeting patrons no matter where they are in life. Um, April loves being outside and enjoys reading, playing with technology, and spending time with her family. Um, welcome, April. So just to jump in, this conversation is going to have two parts. Uh, the first part uh, is going to focus on how we invite uh, partners into our library, uh, and the second part focuses on how we meet partners where they are. Um, and before we jump into that, um, uh, Jordan uh, is going to put a link uh, into the chat, um, and that link uh, is a Jamboard. Uh, and if you click on that link, um, uh, we'd love to get you to record uh, some of the thoughts about um, in the small and rural communities that you serve, uh, who are some of your best partners? Um, so in, in small and rural communities, who are the best uh, best uh, library partners? What have been your, your experiences? Um, you can record uh, some thoughts uh, in the Jamboard uh, as we get started, um, and we'll come back to, to that Jamboard uh, during the, the uh, unconference portion. But without further ado, enough of me talking, let's turn things over to our panelists. Um, uh, Leah, I'd love to uh, begin with you. Um, um, so, uh, 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 oh, let me see, I lost my train of thought here. Give me one second, sorry about that. So Leah, um, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the community resource fairs uh, held monthly at your library. Uh, tell us about uh, how you got uh, these different organizations to come to your library for these resource fairs. Um, and any lessons learned uh, in terms of how, how we can uh, bring bring a, a range of partners uh, into our libraries uh, to, to ultimately help our communities. Sure, we began this program in June um, by inviting our agencies to come to the library once a month. Um, we started out by uh, 
inviting partner agencies that we had worked with in terms of going out to do public outreach. I like to um, try to take program, library programs out into the community as much as possible to reach populations that can't get to the library. So um, like the domestic violence shelter um, was one um, that I had gone and done programs at and signed people up for library cards over there. Um, and so I already had sort of a, a good contact list from that kind of work going out into the community. And then also the United Way was really helpful. Our local United Way uh, chapter um, sent it out on their list. And uh, the first one we had like 17 agencies, including the housing authority. And um, we're still trying to reach to get some different agencies involved. We've had um, 16 to 20 agencies show up at each one. Um, the first couple were really more uh, networking for uh, social service agencies. Um, we didn't have a lot of patrons coming into these programs when we first started advertising it. Um, as we've gotten the word out, though, we have grown um, sort of a reputation and people are starting to show up to um, learn about how they can get resources uh, for food and um, housing and well-being. Um, we've got several mental health agencies and um, we've had the housing authority. We've had the health department. Um, we have uh, some groups from the local college um, sometimes come with like their workforce development um, opportunities from the community college. Um, we started offering food and that really helps pull patrons into this program and get uh, sort of a reputation that Oh, and, and they'll feed you. So um, I think that's really helped. Um, and that has helped retain the community partners is getting actually getting people in the door to connect with services. Um, so I think we started in June and then in September we started um, offering food. And I've been reaching out to restaurant local restaurants and pizza places, um, asking for discounts and free food. And I've gotten free food. Um, I, I haven't had any restaurant offer to do it every month. So it's a, it's quite a bit of work actually um, every month reaching out and um, but I do get um, pretty good discounts on pizza and different um, the Olive Garden and the um, Longhorn Steakhouse have given um, free food before so that's been really helpful. Um, we have never had less than sixteen. Um, show up. We just had uh, an event last Tuesday, a resource fair last Tuesday, and we probably had about 50 people, members of the public, and 25 um, people with organizations. We had uh, 15 tables set up and 25 like um, outreach people there with their organizations. Um, we had somebody from Medicare Services there. We had the local career center there. We've got a place called Paducah Cooperative Ministry, and that is, um, they have a, a shelter as well as a kitchen. And um, there are some great organizations in town that uh, we have like a community kitchen very near the library. They don't have the staff or the resources to send somebody over. So I have also been working on um, just getting information. I always have a library table in there and I, give out contact information and maps and stuff. Um, I've made a brochure um, of emergency services for food and housing um, that I hand out. A lot. We hand that out at the desk a lot in the library anyway, but then I, I always have that at the resource fair um, because some of the great resources in, in our community, they don't just don't have the staff. So um, I guess you asked about what some lessons learned. I guess persistence is good and things change. You know, sometimes different organizations are going through flux. They have been, um, between directors. I've had that happen with a couple organizations. They're changing directors. So there'll be a few months where I can't get a response. Nobody knows what's going on. And then, um, also some agencies that I've worked with, um, over time, they haven't had staff, but then suddenly they'll have volunteers they can send. So um, just kind of persistence and communication and just keeping up my email blasts. And um, I have to set a schedule to send out a, you know, a reminder. It's next week. Please join us. Please RSVP. Um, and it's been, it's been really good.
Yeah, thanks, Leah. And and I think it's really, really fascinating what you said about uh, how during the first resource fair, uh, you didn't have a lot of public participation, but uh, you saw a lot of networking among uh, the different organizations that came. Um, and, and we actually heard uh, almost the exact uh, same sentiment came from um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We featured the High Point Library here in North Carolina that um, they've been doing health fairs uh, at their library on an annual basis, not a, not a month basis like your community resource fairs but um uh, we heard about how during these these kind of library fairs um often uh in addition to having a new way to reach the public uh, these organizations often have a new way to collaborate and form relationships amongst themselves um so that's great so yeah we'd love to love to follow up on that um but for now i'm gonna turn things to april um um and so in, in, in Rutherford County, North Carolina, um, um, uh, I want to ask, uh, ask you about a, a staffing decision that you made uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, thanks to your uh, recommendation, I was able to talk with one of the members of your staff, um, Maria Davis. Uh, who was uh, was and is an amazing person, um, uh, but but not not a traditional kind of librarian background. Um, could you tell us a little bit about Maria um, and how, by having someone like Maria on your staff, um, you've been able to build stronger connections and collaborations uh, with with the communities that you serve? Definitely. So. Um... Maria has been with the library now for about eight years. It'll be eight years in June. And I've been the library director for nine years. I have been with the Rutherford County for 12 years though. When I became the library director nine years ago, um, I came from the Western part of the county. I was at a branch in the Western part of the county. That area was a huge advocate for the library. Everybody that used the library was a huge supporter. They have a wonderful friends group. They were very active in anything the library was doing. When I came over to be the library director in the central part of the county, I realized that there was a huge difference in the patronage at the library and the, the support that we had and that there were not the community relationships going on that I saw on the other side of the county. I'm not from Rutherford County. I'm not even from North Carolina. Um, and I was struggling to make those immediate connections that I needed. Who did I need to talk with at um, the Kiwanis Club that was central to the, that part of the county? Who, who did I need to speak with that was the best person with the business organizations in the central part of the county? So I just started to develop a new position in the library that was going to be um, kind of like a marketing uh, outreach campaign person who's going to be my person that goes with me, can speak for the library and be that yes person all the time. Um, so I, I wrote up a new position and Maria came in. She has a school background. She was actually came to me from the school system. She was working at a grant funded position with homeless students. And in that position, she made a lot of connections with nonprofits within the county, um, other organizations that helped with food, housing, anything that had to do with child advocacy. Um, she had already made those connections in the past. And, and not only that, she um, is from Rutherford County. She went to school here. She's been here for a long time. So she, whomever she didn't know, she knew a way to find somebody that knew them. And I asked her one question in the interview about why should I hire you? And she said, because I'm not gonna take no for an answer. If I do get no, that means no right now, no today. It doesn't mean no tomorrow or no you know, next month. So I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna wait till I get a yes. And I was just like, this is the person I need on my team. And from then on, it has been a roller coaster. We have definitely built some relationships and even ones that don't work out, um, they sometimes come back to us if we can help them or they can help us. It, it's been great. Maria has since moved on to be a branch manager. She's actually moved to the library that I originally started from in this county and, and she's continuing to succeed, but she helps um, 
I'm sorry, I just saw a question. So I hired somebody with sales experience. No, um, she does not have sales experience. She is definitely an educator. She is a, a certified teacher. Um, she's been in the teaching field for 15, 20 years. Um, but she just had that personality that I think I lack. I kind of am not the most engaging person at the party sometimes. And, and I needed that uh, wing person with me. So she has definitely come up with some of our springboarding ideas where we were revamping our strategic plan or our long range plan for what the library saw in 2016, I believe it was. And we had to come up with a central theme of what do we want the community to see the library as? Because we were starting kind of at, at ground one. Um, other county departments did not see the library as a, uh, a partner in anything. They didn't see us as helping them with anything. They didn't, we were not the go-to person for we need help getting this message out to um, our senior citizens or to our kids or to our parents that are struggling. Um, and we needed to make that happen. I, I'm not too sure I might've gotten a little off track there, but. <laughs> no, no, I think that, that's perfect, uh, April. And and yeah, I love, I love kind of this, this thinking about, okay, so what, what strengths do I have, but then also what, uh, what weaknesses may I have and, and how can I kind of use you staffing um, to really kind of, uh, in your case, uh, bring in someone who's kind of that, that outgoing people person connector um, and has that, that strong kind of community knowledge um, in a way that you uh, perhaps didn't, at least when you first moved to the community, although I'm sure you've you've kind of built that knowledge up over time. Um, so yeah, and really uh, uh, an amazing way of kind of using staffing to kind of be a catalyst uh, to jumpstarting community relationships, uh, which um, uh, you've used uh, to do all sorts of things in collaboration with a, a local uh, legacy hospital foundation um, and so many others. Um, uh, and and I see uh, Rayo. Uh, it's it's been a few years, uh, so April, you may not have it, but uh, Rayo is definitely interested in in the position description that you used. Uh, okay. uh, maybe an interest in in finding the Maria Davis um, and and their community. Um, but uh, but yeah. Um, but uh, but maybe maybe April just as a quick follow up to that. Um, how what were how did in terms of uh, getting Maria on your team? Um, how did you kind of get the position description out uh, so that it would be in front of Maria? Is there any any kind of tips that you have? And if you're if you're trying to find um, someone like that in terms of uh, making sure that the right person sees sees the opportunity. We posted it everywhere. We put it in the local paper. We put it in the. Um, like the penny saver, the trade magazine that's free that people pick up. Um, we put it on every social media account we could think of. Um, it was on, the, of course, the county website. We had a big news blast at the top of the library website that the library was looking for a community engagement partner to join our team. And um, I do not have a current description that we use to hire for that position, but I can tell you the things that were in it were, um, they weren't necessarily the things that we think of when we're advertising for a library position. I wanted somebody who could um, not only do programs, but coordinate programs, who could write about the programs, who could engage with people in all walks of life, and then they had to be able to pitch their ideas to me during the interview. So they came with a portfolio, even if it was made up, it didn't have to be stuff that they had actually done, but what could they bring to me at the library? So they brought that with them to the interview. Yeah, thank you so much, April. I realized I forgot to unmute. Um, and yeah, and and uh, we, I, I definitely have some more questions, but uh, I love seeing some questions come in on the chat. So let's go ahead and just just see. Um, and so uh, this is a question for both Leah and April. So April, you mentioned kind of um, historically uh, other other county units may not see the library uh, is the asset that it is, um, and so may not see all that the library has to offer for the county government. Um, uh, and and Leah, I'd love to love to hear from your perspective as well in McCracken County. Um, what are some of the techniques that you and other than the library have used to kind of ensure that that others kind of in in your county 
uh, are really aware of, of everything that, that the library and the library staff bring to, bring to the table. Um, so I'll, I'll pose that uh, to both of you, uh, April and Leah. I don't know if, um, yeah, Leah, do you want to start? And then, and then April? Sure. It's, well, honestly, it's a constant struggle because um, uh, no matter how much we advertise things that we do, we still have people telling us, oh, I didn't know you did that. Um, and I know one of our previous directors was at a meeting where um, this was like eight years ago, but she came back so upset because she somebody had said something like, um, we're gonna, they were planning a community maker space and they said that it would be um, kind of like the library, but more tech with technology and more advanced. And like, she was like, we have technology here. You know, people don't know what libraries do. And so it is, it's a constant, you know, marketing issue. Um, we don't have a marketing person in our library. So it's something that um, we, um, the managers and the director and like, you know, all hands on deck. It's like getting the word out. Um, we um, would like a marketing director, but we don't have it in our budget. Um, we, um, I think it, in terms of getting the word out, it's just consistency and showing up. We send people to different civic organizations and um, they're like, there's a, there's an opi opioid addiction task force. I know our director goes to, and then that's like a whole contact list that we can send out um, information to. And um, like I said, working with the United Way, uh, things like that. Yeah, thanks, Leah. And I love what you said about all hands on deck. And and I can't remember if I mentioned in my in your introduction, but Leah used to work uh, in youth services. Um, and one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm sure you all in, in small and rural libraries know that uh, everyone does a little bit of everything. Um, and in Rutherford County, uh, I, I I learned uh, the library makerspace was uh, an initiative of kind of the the IT uh, librarian or, um, but yeah. Um, Anyhow, April, I'd love to hear what, what are some of the, the techniques you found to kind of increase the library's uh, visibility um, uh, as a partner, uh, especially uh, among other county county departments? Well, we sat down as a staff. I'm a, a firm believer in having like just jam sessions all the time. Whenever we can have a spur of the moment time to sit down and kind of throw some ideas together, what can we do to engage other people? Um, and so we just started writing grants. And when we get grants, we would write it, write them and, and use those grants to springboard to the ideas. So currently we have hydroponic gardening towers. Um, we have the Charlie Cart mobile kitchens. These are all things that we thought, okay, we can use these for connecting with the school system, connecting with the hospital, connecting with our Kiwanis groups. Um, even different things like the extension office that we work with. We use all those grants, we write them to bring something to the library that we can use with our community and then create a partnership with that. And just like Leah said, we're always in, I hate to say we're in their face, but we are. If we send them an email and they don't respond and we call them and they never get back to us or they feel like they don't seem like they can engage with us, we just walk and knock up on their door. You know, you go to the door and you knock, they're not gonna turn you away when you're right there. So you just keep going and what can I do to help the health department? Do we need to have a health fair? Do we need to have blood pressure checks? Can we bring that out to the far side of the county where they don't have those advantages because they don't, they don't have transportation. We don't have public transportation here. They don't have any way of getting to the central, the, the health department that's in the middle of the county. Um, so we just kept going every time and just being consistent with that message that we're here to help you. We go to community fairs. Um, our county is very uh, territorial in their little towns and spaces, which is, is unique to me, but I've learned, I've learned how to navigate those roads. And um, we go to individual town fairs and 
puff up our library wares and we show them everything we have. And then we say, and you know, we can come and do this for you. We even use the escape rooms. We have um, a box of escape rooms and we have an online subscription and we use that. We go to the school systems and we give the teachers a little break where they have a, a situation where they have to work together to get out building those small relationships, it puts it in their mind to come back later when they need something from us to say, hey, did you ask Kenneth, the IT librarian at the county library about the makerspace and you know the fact that they have green screen technology? I didn't know that. See, because it is, again, they don't know what the library has and, and we can tell them every day and you're still gonna find someone who doesn't know. Yeah, but I, I love that, April, and I love that sentiment of, of you all really know the worth uh, that you have uh, to the community, and you're not afraid to share that worth uh, with others, um, because in, 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 and unless you share share the worth uh, and the value that you have, um, others may not not see that. Um, so I, I love that. Um, and, and I just, uh, Jordan, put uh, a link uh, into our second Jamboard, uh, which is uh, a space for you to share in your kind of small and rural communities. Um, what have been the biggest challenges that you all have faced in terms of building kind of these collaborative relationships? Um, and have there been any, any strategies that you've developed uh, to kind of circumvent uh, what you see as your biggest challenges? Um, um, and so, yeah, uh, we, we see some questions coming in, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, uh, segue into uh, the second part of our conversation. Keep those, keep those questions and thoughts coming in the chat. Um, but for right now, I'd like to segue uh, into back to Leah. Um, and so in the interviews that I did with, with folks uh, in McCracken County, Kentucky, uh, one of the most remarkable stories um, I think I heard um, was how the story about how your library became a site um, in the school district's uh, nutrition bus program, kind of the, the summer feeding program. Um, and you mentioned to me that the seed of that partnership was a conversation uh, that you had with the school's nutrition coordinator um, that took place uh, while the two of you were volunteering at your local food bank. Um, and so what, a, what an interesting example about how kind of a serendipitous conversation led to an amazing partnership. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you happened to be uh, at the food bank in the first place? Um, <laughs> Uh, what that conversation looked like, um, and how you uh, and the, the school have continued to work together around uh, food security issues. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, I began, I showed up to volunteer at the local food bank because the person we had worked with to set up our little free pantry at the library had put out a call for volunteers. And um, at the time there was an organization in Nuka called um, Project Pomona and they were installing little free pantries around town and um, also organizing these um, weekly and monthly meals, different places and like getting meals out to people, um, delivering groceries to some of the um, housing um, authority sites. And uh, so, I just answered the call to go um, deliver meals. And while we were waiting, we had to sort the meals into like where they were all going and who was going to drive what where. And um, while we were sort of milling about, I met Lindsay uh, from the school system. She's the nutrition director at the public schools. And she does a lot, um, including their summer feeding program. And I had been wanting to figure out a way to partner with them. We actually, um, before we became a site, we wanted to go with them and hand out books, like just follow their route um, and hand out books. And so we did that for a couple of summers um, before they decided to make the library a site. Um, and it's it changes year to year, depending on library staffing. And they also don't know um always what their summer feeding setup is going to look like until right beforehand it's grant funded and through the state and a lot of times they don't know um they're not promoting it until you know after the end of school um this year i have uh lindsay actually coming to the library for our summer reading kickoff event we're having a big family lawn games party to kick off summer reading and she's going to come and promote the summer feeding 
schedule. I don't know actually how we're going to partner, what the partnership is going to look like, or if the library is going to be a stop this summer. We won't know until um, a little closer to time. But she did say yes. Um, once She should know by June 1st, and she'll be here to have a table at the um, summer reading kickoff and hand out um, information about it. So that's still um, a great connection that I made in meeting her there at that time. And um, even, yeah, even though I don't work in the kids department anymore, I'm now the adult services manager. I still um, get to call her up or email her occasionally and ask if we can, how we can partner. Um, I, during COVID, they were delivering meals um, even before summer when the schools shut down in 2020. Um, they mobilized uh, meal delivery through the school buses and um, we worked with, then worked with them um, to get books and reading challenges out to kids. The library doors were still closed, but we were um, giving, you know, delivering them packets to take out with their meal delivery. So um, yeah, it's been a great partnership, especially for our youth outreach. Yeah, thanks, Leah. And I love I love what you said about how you don't uh, entirely know kind of what uh, what the partnership is going to look like going forward, but uh, you know that there will be a partnership. Um, and and I love that uh, that idea that um, uh, with with some of our closest partners, um, uh, what that relationship is going to look like may change over time. But um, but it's the the key thing is having having the the partner um, that you're able to call and that uh, they in turn are able to call you. Um, and that's actually a segue to uh, the next question that I have uh, for for April. Um, uh, as you and I talked about, one of the things that I found to be really remarkable was the fact uh, that you were invited to join uh, the advisory board um, of your local USDA cooperative uh, extension office. So um, based on uh, the, the fact that you all had worked so closely on, on cooking and gardening and other things, um, asked to join that advisory board. So uh, tell tell us a little bit about that. Uh, tell us about um, other other kind of uh, community convenings that you've been part of, like outdoor Rutherford. Um, yeah, why what 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 do you see as the value of kind of participation in these kind of um, uh, boards or committees that bring together people from across the community? Well, I am a firm believer that if you continue to put yourself out there as the face of the library, no matter no matter what position you have in the library those people are going to eventually come back to you. So uh, once again, I'm gonna go back to our um, grant writing, which brought us the hydroponic towers and our um, Charlie Cart mobile kitchens. Those put us on the radar for cooperative extension agents. Um, we have in the past before the hydroponic towers and the cooking demos that we were doing, we had had an occasional um, agent come in and do you know, something about, the native plant species or something about the uh, animals that were in our area or insects in our area that were detrimental to what we had. But we were not having a great partnership with them where uh, we did a little bit for them and they did a little bit for us. But once we had the towers and the cooking demo kitchens, that changed. Um, we were piggybacking on programs. They were helping us in the summer with items. They were connecting us with high school horticulture program. Um, we took our hydroponic tower to the local hospital and that was put up in their atrium area. And everywhere that we took our hydroponic tower, there were signs advertising the library, advertising the high school, talking about cooperative extension and the services that they have. Um, so it began to build a larger partnership. Um, when it was time for the director over at the extension service, they needed to write a new strategic plan. Um, he called me on the phone and he said, I have a position on my board and I think I need you to help me. <laughs> so uh, that was a wonderful opportunity and, and I continue to serve for them um, whenever they call. And it's, it's been insightful for me because they, they have things just like the library that I didn't know they did. And I have always known about the extension service. Um, my mom was an extension agent many, many years ago. So I've always been familiar with them. But again, you open a door and you learn so much more. So um, 
in addition to the cooperative extension office, we also have partnerships with, uh, it's called the ROC, but it's the Rutherford Outdoor Coalition. Um, they are a, a local nonprofit that uh, of course is an outdoors group. They meet for hiking and climbing. They, uh, they walk shelter dogs along our rail trail. Um, so that is a partnership that has continued to grow. Um, but you know, through every partnership, you don't always have successes. Um, at one point, we investigated the idea of putting bicycles, lending bicycles through the library for people to use on the rail trail system, which is a walking and running and biking path throughout our county. Um, we had seen other libraries in, I think there was one or two in North Carolina at the time, and there are several across the nation that, that lend bikes and have a bike program. You use your library card, you check out a bike, you take it on a trail. Um, so we tried to get that going with the Rutherford Outdoor Coalition. It, it just didn't work out for us. Um, they, there were too many expenses involved. Um, we could not write a grant. We just didn't have the momentum behind it. Uh, we don't have anyone on staff that has biking expertise. Um, so we couldn't repair the bikes a continual basis. Um, the good thing is a Rutherford Outdoor Coalition was able to write their own grant. They have their own sy system that they do and they use it through the school system for the bikes. So that's good. There's still bikes going out. The library is not part of it, but they still see us as a partner. Um, with the school board, we have had difficulty. I, I don't know why. Um, building a relationship with our local public school system. We have two very successful charter schools in our county, and then we have the local public schools and we have several private schools. Um, but getting into the public school system in this county had been very difficult, even to do story time. Um, I, I, I don't know what the story was behind that, but when we brought in the hydroponic towers and we were able to connect with that one horticulture club at a high school, that opened the door to other partnerships with them. In the um, years since, we have also started offering library student accounts, which um, we use the student's uh, student ID number as their library barcode number, and they can use any of our online services by just logging in with their student ID number. They can come in and select a a uh, limited number of physical items for checkout. And those student accounts, they um, we still have fines in our county, but those student accounts do not accrue fines on late materials. They only accrue lost and damaged fees. And that has been a program that's been going on for several years now that has grown. So through small partnerships, whether they are successful or not, there's always an open door. Yeah, I love that, uh, April. And, and as you were talking, I was reminded of the Collaborative Summer Library Program. Their theme last year was Oceans of Possibilities. Um, and hearing you talk, it's 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 uh, when, when you kind of get started doing uh, something with another organization, you're, you're kind of opening up Oceans of Possibilities. Um, and I love that idea of kind of, uh, yeah, that, that connection you had with the horticultural club with kind of uh, opening up kind of an ocean of possibilities in terms of what, what may be uh, possible with, with the schools. Um, um, so this, this is great. Um, um, I want to, we can, we can kind of uh, um, keep talking about uh, lots of different things. I want to just, uh, just for a second, um, I'm going to make a quick segue uh, to our jam boards um, because uh, I want to thank, uh, they've been people, you all have been really, really contributing to these jam boards. Um, so just want to, want to pull this up. Um, so um, if you haven't already, uh, people have been sharing some of the best, uh, best partners. Um, uh, that you've worked with, um, and there's a lot of different different organizations, everything from churches to businesses uh, to uh, county office on aging. But um, uh, so keep keep kind of adding and sharing kind of uh, your best partners that may inspire some some others here on the call. Um, but uh, I also want to thank people for sharing some of the challenges that you faced. Um, uh, similar, Leah mentioned how with their community resource fairs, there can be turnover in other organizations' leadership, and that's that's mentioned here. Um, uh, sometimes people feel like they have to just be kind of continually uh, beating the bushes. Um, 
Uh, someone said recent book challenges have made some people look at the library in an unfavorable light. Um, uh, I'd love to hear um, uh, April and Leah um, uh, ha has that, has some of the the book challenges and and kind of the politicization of un library services as a result. Um, has that affected any of your partnerships or relationships, uh, or has that been something that you've had to to deal with in in your communities? I don't think it really has negatively affected any of our relationships. Um, They've passed some sort of scary legislation in Kentucky recently um, in creating sort of a, a pathway to challenging books in schools, um, setting up sort of a precedent for it and a, a institutionalization of it. Um, and our mayor actually reached out to our library director um, to say, we, we support you, you know, let us know if there's anything you know of that we can do to let people know that we support the library or if you need anything. Um, so um, I think as far as I know, I, in the, what I've experienced in our community and the people that we work with, um, we um, have, have not had any negative fallout from any of that. We have had a couple of book challenges at our library, but we haven't really had any um, any press out of that or negative fall, fallout. Yum. I'd have to agree. We haven't really had to deal with much. We've had a couple of um, questions about some displays we've had, and we've had a few books, but they've never actually filled out a formal complaint, so we're not really having to deal with that currently. Um, I did see one thing, Noah, in here from about um, not having a large enough staff to create programs and partnerships and applications for grants and whatnot. And I do want to say that um, I I know very there are uh, small libraries all over, and I will say that it, I have three libraries. There's the main library where I'm at and two branches, but I will say that I don't consider us to be very large. Um, I, I know that they're probably smaller. I'm not saying they're not, but we have one of my branches has one full time and one part time, and then another branch has two full time. At the library that I'm at, there are one, two, three. So you have to count them. There's a uh, four full time besides myself and, and two part time. Um, and I want to say that you have to find the different hats. We all wear different hats all day long. Um, I do circulation work. I do cataloging, I, I, I do a million different things every day, but you, you find the best people on your staff to do the small things, to build those partnerships and to, and to think about it before you write your grants. And when you're writing your grants, you will be surprised at how many of them ask the same questions. They might use slightly different language, but if you have a template that you use and you can copy and paste, um, that has been supremely helpful for us, copy and paste. Uh, use the same language all the time. And, you know, don't ask for money if you don't already know what you're going to use it for. I have a rule that I'm not asking for money if I can't, one, spend it exactly the way that I want to spend it. We're not asking for money just to ask for it. We've got to know what we want to do with it. And that has helped tremendously with writing grants. And I have also found that um, smaller companies that are in your county, um, like the factories, they often don't have a large grant process. If you can get to the administrative assistant and say, hey, we've got a big project that we're looking at, we'd like to put your name on it. Who do I talk to about getting that funding for us? I had to just go and do a 15 minute spiel one day and that was it. I had money for a story walk and that organization, it was actually a factory has left our county, but I still put their name on everything because they gave us the money for it and, and no one else would at that time. Yeah, and I love that uh, that thought, April, about uh, sometimes it doesn't have to be some big convoluted kind of grant application. Sometimes it's just saying, like, yeah, to the large entities in your community, hey, do you have money that you can give us? And I know uh, Maria Davis, that staff member, like she talked about doing that with kind of the local Legacy Hospital Foundation, like um, one of the largest philanthropic organizations and and. Maria just knew people there and it's like, hey, let's <laughs> let's tap into this. Uh, and so I, I, it doesn't always have to be some large convoluted grant application. Sometimes it can just be having kind of like 
your your feelers up for where funding may be available and and not being afraid to ask um and 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 if you frame it that way it can seem much more approachable and much more doable i think sometimes people get paralyzed with the idea of like oh i have to sit down and write this 20 page grant application i mean you could but you could also just say like hey do you have some we want to do this like uh <laughs> can you can you help us um um and and I see a comment in the chat. Uh, Beth is saying uh, sometimes uh, school systems may have grant writers, so perhaps um, you can tap into kind of the the resources that other entities have. Uh, community foundations, um, uh, state library could be useful as well. Um, um, uh, Lynette has asked about um, not having time to create partnerships. I've been really lucky in finding. There are people in our community whose job it is and mission it is to get the word out about the services that they're offering. And so sometimes you can get those people to come and do a library program or even just set up a table in your lobby. Um, we had a gentleman approaching us. Um, pro he works with um, Kentucky Health Benefits Exchange, and he wanted to set up a table in our lobby and have him coming to the resource fairs, and he wants to do educational programs here at the library. The problem is just getting people to show up for them. So, and I think with the county extension office too, they have agents who um, want to do programs both at the extension office and out in the community. So they might come to your library and do a program. So um, I know it's work to reach out to those people, but then you're asking them to come do work at your library. And um, that can often work out because that's their mission. Yeah, and and I think that that's a great great advice to 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 yeah to recognize that there's lots of other organizations uh, that may be looking for for opportunities to kind of bring bring their their resources uh, to the community via the library. Um, uh, I, I think it's really interesting, uh, and I've heard this uh, from other places. Someone someone wrote uh, that a group asked to have uh, a summer lunch program at the small local branch, uh, but they didn't send any volunteers uh, to staff it. Um, so <laughs> created a situation where um, a partner was kind of uh, asking or expecting the library staff to kind of um, uh, yeah, run this program while also doing their jobs. Um, uh, have you are, ever had experiences like that where where kind of uh, there's there's kind of um, uh, perhaps miscommunication uh, with with partners um, uh, in in a situation where it's not clear um, what uh, what what the expectations are in terms of your time or your staff's time. I have. I had a small miscommunication recently at the resource fair. I sent out an email saying, community partners wishing to participate, please let me know if you will be there. Well, I guess I had neglected at some point, left off the part about having a table. And so I had some people say they would have a tape. I thought they were saying they would have a table, but they really just wanted to come and walk around. And so then uh, somebody came up to me at the resource fair and said, I'm looking for so-and-so from such and such organization. And I said, well, they didn't show up. The table's empty. And they're like, well, no, I'm, I'm from the organization. I'm here. I'm looking for the other person that we sent. And um, so they, it was just, you know, you just have to. And I have a blanket email that I send out every week. And I do update it with new dates and details that I've now added some more clear language about let me know if you will not be attending, but if you will be having a table. <laughs> uh, I can only say that we um, took our one of our hundred Pontic Towers when near, uh, we took it to a local school and our IT librarian, because that was his, his um, project that he was working on, you know, that multiple hat thing again. And I was helping him set it up in the lobby of the school, which is where the person that we had met with said, hey, this is where we want you to put this up. Well, this is not an easy thing to set up. It, it takes a few minutes. So we get it completely set up. We're trying to figure out the best plus place to plug it in. We're teaching the person that's gonna take care of it from the local gardening club, how, how to add the food and the nutrients and how to set the timer. And the principal comes in and, and says, oh, no, no, no. That, that can't go there. You're going to have to take that down. And it was just, it was not a good day. We had many meetings to get to, but uh, 
luckily the the gardening leader for the school she was able to take it apart and relocate it but i just had had it that day some days you just have to to smile and and keep trucking <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and I really appreciate you both uh, sharing that. Uh, and I think it's really important to share stories like that, because I, I think sometimes, uh, yeah, people people go to webinars and imagine that uh, people in other places are kind of knocking it out of the park uh, every single day. Uh, but the reality is uh, things don't always work out uh, exactly the way that you think it's going to. Um, but that doesn't have to, to to kind of lead you to kind of just uh, stop, stop trying to work collaboratively with others. Um, um, and, and I see kind of uh, someone in the challenge said um, uh, uh, they they're not sure that the, the staff of their library see the value of collaboration. I'd love to love to hear from from either of you. Um, uh, April, you're you're a director. Um, Leah, you're you're kind of um, a, 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 I guess a division manager. If, I don't know if that would be the right language, but um, uh, what what are some of the techniques that you've seen or have employed that have kind of uh, helped to really um, uh, enable uh, the staff of your libraries to really see the value of collaboration. Any any thoughts or insights on that topic? Well, I have to say, as a director, one of the things I do is I try and gauge staff members in their level of engagement and figure out um, where their interests lie. And you're you're always going to have one person that is not on board with something. That's usually what I found. But you've got to find the thing that they're passionate about and give them some responsibility in that that idea or program or partnership that they are considering. And then hopefully through that, through their personal involvement in it, they see the value. If they have a little bit of ownership, they will carry your torch. I think that's really great and really mirrors sort of my experience with that too. Um, I, we like to send staff when we can to community events and we send staff to the um, farmer's market. And I know that like half of my staff will not uh, want to be outdoors in the sun ever. And the other half of my staff, you know, they have other strengths, <laughs> but um, I have a lot of staff that really jump at the opportunity to go do an outreach event like that. Um, and so it is just, yeah sort of finding different ways that di different people with different um, preferences of what how they want to put themselves out there um, can fit into. Yeah, and I love that that idea of kind of really playing to the strength of your staff. And yeah, th even something as simple as some some library staff would love to be outside uh, at a farmer's market. Others that would be kind of their vision of hell. <laughs> and so so just having having that knowledge um, and thinking thinking appropriately in terms of trying to trying to encourage um, uh, staff to kind of uh, get involved with things that they're gonna they're gonna find meaningful and engaging. Um, and so uh, uh, I'd love to, at this point, uh, invite if anyone would like to, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to uh, turn on your microphone or raise your hand. Um, but I'd also love to take a, take a little bit of time, April and Leah, um, as you've kind of heard each other talk, um, is there any questions or thoughts that you'd like to share with each other just, just based on kind of what you've heard each other say or are seeing now uh, in the Jamboard? Uh, the, floor, the floor is open at this point. I would love more information about the mobile kitchens. If there's a link or something you could share about that. I'm really, um, that sounds amazing. Yeah, let me grab that information. I am uh, in a rural area, so I'm using a laptop. So I'll have to turn to my computer to get it, but then I can bring it over here. No problem. Um, I, I am very interested in, you talked about having your um, fair monthly. Ha have you seen, um, the participation from the patron side and from your vendors, we're going to call them vendors, I guess, uh, pick up since you've started that. Is it consistent monthly or do you have different people every month? It's consistent with the partner organizations. At this point, it's pretty consistent. Um, some started out and then stopped because there weren't a lot of people coming in. Yes. But some have added. So it's been consistent number wise anyway with the partner organizations. The uh, patron participation and um, has definitely grown. Um, it's I find it really hard to actually count 
in the middle of the event. So I'm always struggling with that, but I believe that we had um, nearly 50 people from the public as well as 25 um, people from organizations at the last one. Um, and that's way up, you know, it was, it started out with like four. <laughs> so uh, four people of the public, we would have like 25 people from organizations and four people from the public coming through um, for the first couple and offering food definitely helped with that. Um, and I think um, we have um, experienced more um, homeless people in our library, people, unhoused people, um, definitely over the last, I don't know, it's, it's, I feel like it's grown steadily over the last two years. Um, so it didn't used to be a thing that you noticed, but it's, it's a thing that um, is happening now. There are people who are unhoused and are looking for resources for food and shelter um, at our library every day. And so um, it's not really a hard sell to say, you know, we have people offering resources for housing and well-being and food upstairs. Come on up. Okay, that's awesome. It's just persistence is key. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, and and I don't know, I don't want to put words in people's mouths, but I, I do, I do think from what I've heard in the interviews, kind of showing up is, uh, is a huge, huge part of of winning. It, it seems like uh, I've heard that, um, yeah, that persistence. Um, um, and yeah, thanks April for putting putting that link into the Charlie card. And I see uh, Shauna Shauna Bryce, um, I think in in Madison County, North Carolina, um, uh, put a link to uh, a kitchen, uh, another mobile cart um, that they uh, have. So I think there's a few a few options now now out there. Um, and these are also things that uh, that funders uh, really love to fund. Um, uh, I, I believe April, you you acquired yours uh, through. Um, uh, and in fact, I think you have two now, but but through through grant funding, so it's it's uh, it's the type of thing that um, is is kind of an easy thing to ask for in terms of a grant application. Um, um, yeah, April, uh, would you like to share any anything more about kind of um, yeah the, the process of kind of uh, putting together the grant to to acquire your Charlie Cart? Um, for the Charlie Cart. It was finding the best fit grants. Um, locally, we have a uh, RHI Legacy. It's a, uh, a nonprofit that when the local hospital was bought out by another entity, there were funds available. It created a, a nonprofit and they continued to support the health initiatives throughout the county. So find that organization that is going to align with the ideals that you're trying to get across through whatever you're doing with your grant. Um, with our Charlie cart, that was a shoe in. It's something that we can use from small children all the way to helping with uh, elderly people that are, you know, they don't want to eat a grilled cheese or a can of soup every day. So we have, uh, we wrote the grant so that it reflected all the different members in the community and how we could connect to them, connect with them on a health level, uh, at being healthy at home, whether they're growing things at home and then cooking them or just having to eat on a budget, or maybe it's uh, introducing some of the more um, cultural favors. We use our Charlie cart for doing different recipes where we introduce different ethnic, ethnic recipes. So we try and do that to connect with other members in our community. Um, because I think, as she said earlier, food will bring them in. And that's sometimes a springboard for other programs that we have. So, um, yeah. I had a, um, we had Atmos Energy reach out to us last year about a way to, for them to donate books to the community, to specifically third graders. And now they're, um, so they did a program where we bought books for third graders and through the schools. Um, but now they're, this year, I believe they're sponsoring our summer reading um, in part by showing up with a grill truck and grilling hot dogs at our summer reading kickoff. So I'm really excited about that. That, that's an excellent point. Some 
entities that you would, I never even thought they had grants, but things like uh, Duke Power here in North Carolina, they have a whole section of, of nothing but grants. And usually they have, they have rolling grants, they have grant times that they advertise to the public. But if you know the representative for your area and you have an idea, they will definitely work with you. They'll even help you read over your grant before you turn it in. And they want to sponsor initiatives that focus on um, STEM and, and STEAM and how, how we're teaching our young people to utilize energy. And so they buy books for us. They buy kits that people check out. They provide um, money for presenters that are going to talk about how to use different STEM kits that we have. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. And then, um, then another thing we have the uh, a difference the cooperative um, energy company they fund things they fund for school systems so they fund for the library also it's just there are grants out there you just have to know who to go to and how to write the grant to get what you're looking for yeah i i, I love that uh, and i love this uh, this idea april that uh, that that uh, part uh, a big part uh, of grant being successful in grant is, is knowing people so it, like like most things it comes down to relationships and kind of knowing knowing people and and knowing um uh, yeah who who to go to, to um and and we know that there's a lot of funders uh, that that do want to kind of uh, get resources uh, into rural communities rural and small town communities um and so uh, just getting in our, on their radar often can be um, an amazing uh, first step to success. Um, and, and I see uh, some folks kind of jump off as we get to the top of the hour. So just uh, just want to do a quick segue. Uh, we're now going to move uh, into the unconference uh, portion of the event. Um, uh, but just wanted to remind everyone, uh, this is the third of four conversations. So we'll have our, our fourth uh, and last uh, conversation um, next Thursday at this very time. Um, you can uh, watch uh, the recordings of the previous conversations on our YouTube channel, and we'll be posting this one uh, to YouTube uh, tomorrow. Uh, so it'll be there. Um, and uh, next week, we'll have our last conversation is going to be on st how start where you are, um, how how librarians uh, in Texas, uh, Virginia, um, and uh, and Delaware uh, early in their careers uh, really hit the ground running um, uh, and and kind of looked looked uh, for opportunities to kind of get involved uh, and form relationships with with community partners early in their careers so it doesn't matter how long you've worked in libraries uh, there's there's always opportunities to kind of go out and, and build relationships um uh, and then Beth, uh, who's on the call, hello, Beth, uh, is going to be joining us for our, our culminating uh, conversation next uh, next Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, in, in which we'll talk about um, uh, some of the great resources that Beth has put together to help uh, librarians and others uh, uh, meet uh, um, uh, uh, meet uh, potential partners, uh, develop relationships, and then and then mobilize those relationships uh, for for successful grant applications. Um, and we'll also be talking about how can we continue to mobilize uh, the kind of the the energy that has formed around this topic to continue to. Um, form new relationships. Um, and to, to April's point earlier, my my mission um, in my career and in some ways in life <laughs> is to really uh, try, try to make uh, public librarians in particular more visible. I think uh, as, as we heard today and we've heard throughout our conversation that the perennial struggle, this, this, this issue of visibility, um, uh, this idea that librarians are not not as visible as they could be, um, and so I really want to want to change that not only in local communities but uh, at the national level. So let's let's talk about how we can how we can do that and and really ensure that um, we're we're advocating for ourselves uh, while also making making ourselves uh, visible so that we we are um, part of uh, of kind of the the solutions to to. Um, um, but uh, oh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go back. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, for just a moment. Um, uh, and so we now have this big uh, Brady brunch of you. But uh, in this unconference portion of the event, um, I know it can seem intimidating the idea of just uh, turning on your microphone um, 
in front of a bunch of people that many of you have never met before. But um, that's uh, exactly what I, I would invite you to do now. So if, uh, for those of you who are, are still here on the call, um, I would love, love to hear kind of what, what have you heard today that resonates? Um, what challenges uh, do you face in your community that you'd like to further discuss? Um, we have about uh, 40, 40 people on the call, so this is a, a, a great opportunity. Um, so I'm going to unmute for just a second and would invite uh, any anyone who's in the room to just uh, unmute um, and, and share share what whatever you're fitting with at the moment. Hi, I'm from a library in New Hampshire. Um, I love uh, I love the idea of finding grants from kind of local places and uh, that uh, may not think of. So that's got me thinking on that. Um, I'd love to hear some if anybody uh, has experience with um, like collaborating for spaces. So like where I'm at, it's a small building, small parking lot, small everything. So when we try to have programs, um, it's it's interesting. <laughs> and I'm fairly new there. So I've been reaching out, trying to see like what there is in town, got a grant for summer programming, found out it had to be ADA accessible. So that's been a whole nother because we've got a few places like the town hall. It's um, they have a ramp to go into one room. It's a little bit larger space, but it's not really accessible. So any um, any thoughts or experiences on how you've collaborated for for using other spaces, finding out about places that have spaces to either you know rent, borrow, do programs together, and even um, I would love to, any thoughts and ideas. Yeah, thank you so much, Michelle. That's a that's a great great question, and I'd love to hear what other uh, thoughts people have. I'll just quickly jump in and share. Um, I know uh, one community in North Carolina that I'm familiar with, uh, and I've worked really closely with uh, a small town of about a thousand people. Um, the library is is very very small, definitely not not big enough to do any large program. Um, and so when they do uh, or want to do a larger program, uh, they'll often use kind of the, 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 a church that is nearby to them. So the church has a much larger open space. Um, and so the church uh, and its space is often the best space to be used uh, for, for their programs. And it's just, um, yeah, they've, they've kind of formed a, a working relationship with the church to be able to use uh, their space. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'd love to. What what other um, kind of thoughts do people on the call have? Uh, small towns, uh, small spaces. Um, where where can we go to kind of find uh, collaboration opportunities around um, spaces that we may be able to work in? Any any thoughts? Uh, April, Leah, anyone else uh, have any any thoughts or advice? This is Leah. I've done a lot of outreach programs, but I don't know that I've ever just reached out about space. I've done like I've gone and done programs at the Boys and Girls Club and at um, schools. Different teachers have reached out to me to come do programs in classrooms. Um, we have we're really lucky to have a city park right across the street from our library. And it's kind of a prohibitive process to do the application um, to use it, but we have in the past um, to do like a big outdoor event. It's um, it's like a little town square. The library's on one side of it, the jail's on the opposite side, and the city hall's on <laughs> to our left, and the courthouse is to the right. Um, so it's a very small park, but there's an application that we can fill out, and we can use it um, if, as long as we do that like three months ahead of time. Um, and this is April, and, and I will say that in our county, we have different parts of the community that they have like community houses which are just like little meeting clubhouses. And we have often used those for programs. We, we do summer reading that way oftentimes. Um, we use our 
outdoor markets, like our farmer's market, they are usually in a covered area and we, in nicer weather, we can use those areas. So we have done programming that way. We count it as outreach, but I could see it just being utilized as a, a regular programming venue if you build that partnership. Yeah, great, great thoughts. And I see someone mentioned in the chat as well about kind of trying to, whether it's on Facebook or if your town has a newspaper, just try to see where, whenever there's a large event, kind of where, where does, where do those large events take place? Um, is it the park? Is it uh, a church? Um, is it another space? Um, uh, yeah, and and I definitely recognize that there's definitely some some communities, especially uh, very small communities, where where there may literally not be kind of an ideal kind of large public space. Um, um, and so it's it it can definitely be uh, an issue. So, but hopefully hopefully this has been been useful to to you, Michelle, and and to others listening in. Um, uh, yeah, and 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 the floor floor is open. Just uh, just so you all are not kind of just looking at uh, <laughs> a sea of kind of uh, black. Um, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just to kind of stimulate uh, conversation. Pull up this uh, this great list, um, which uh, would encourage folks to continue to add to of kind of um, uh, go to go to partners uh, in small town America. Um, just wanna yeah, as as you all are thinking of. Uh, questions or comments um uh just want to uh, say it's it's amazing seeing kind of the range of partners uh, that that people have put in uh, everyone from the DMV uh, to churches um native tribes with history um uh cooperative extension 4H schools colleges local baseball teams uh, football teams um uh substance abuse uh partners um uh, just so many so many different partners um and and my takeaway, just looking at this amazing array of kind of partners, um, is that there uh, there really is not one kind of go to partner for every library across America. Every every community is different, um, and so therefore, uh, kind of the best partners are going to vary from from place to place. Um, um, and and I think yeah, as as we've heard today and throughout our conversations, um, uh, the first step or, or often the first step is just being being visible as a potential partner, putting up your feelers uh, so that others know, hey, the library wants to be part of the part of the the things that are happening in our community, um, and and making that that knowledge known. Um, yeah, and and thanks. Uh, um, let's see, just catching up on the chat here. Um, uh, yeah, Marianne uh, from Iowa says uh, regarding lack of space, uh, she recommends partnering with other libraries in your area and collectively ho hosting the event. Um, I love I love that idea, Marianne. Um, and we saw a lot of that collaboration among libraries during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, in which uh, I know in Illinois, uh, a lot of libraries got together. Um, uh, an individual library could, could would not necessarily have the budget to say bring Nick Offerman uh, from um, Parks and Recreation into the library, but um, libraries across Illinois were able to pool their resources and do one big virtual program with Nick Offerman. Um, and so thinking about is there is there ways to kind of do do something similar kind of library to library um, um, for for kind of a larger event. Um, but yeah, just uh, just uh, we we have about uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, and the floor is open. Um, if you have a question, more likely than not, uh, others have the same question. So. Would love to just to open the floor once again uh, to whatever whatever uh, people would like to discuss or share. Hi, Noah. I have a question. It's Bess. Hi. Um, for Leah, um, who partnered with the United Way to get them to share um, their agency list. How did you do that, Leah? What was the process of requesting or, or did the United Way offer to um, share their agency list with you? 
I believe they did offer, um, not me directly, but to my director, my library director. And um, I believe it was because he was on the opioid task force with the um, person um, who runs the United Way. So it was a, a connection um, and they agreed, uh, they put the word out for us. He was able to put the word out through through the, their email list maybe. Um, and then um, that had sort of also grown into a partnership. We, um, the United Way wanted to hand out cooling packs last summer. So we were a distribution point and a collection point. They were collecting donations for cooling kits and then distributing them both here. So um, that was, uh, all happening at the same time. So they they wanted something from us, I guess, as well. Right. Noah, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's that's great, Leah. Um, and uh, and I know uh, from from talking with some of the United Way uh, folks uh, in Paducah, um, uh, I mean, Paducah, uh, kind of a regional hub, but also a small town. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of personal connections among people. Um, and so there was, uh, and, and I believe still is a particular member of the United Way, um, who at one point, uh, I think had been working for the library, um, or in any case had a strong library connection. So there was kind of a, a ringer, <laughs> as it were, um, uh, for the library uh, in the United Way, which which went, went a long way to, towards kind of um, uh, establishing that, that strong working relationship. That, that's true. I forgot, actually, she did used to work for the library a long time ago. And also, like, I just know her from coming into the library with her kids. So. Yeah, and and I think that's uh and and I, I think sometimes we there's a, a certain poo pooing of kind of the the blurring of personal and professional. But um, I mean, I grew up in a small town. Like I always I always tell people like I didn't realize until I went away to college uh, that when you go to a bank, uh, you had to show photo identification before they gave you money. Like um, I mean, when I was a kid, like I just went to the bank and it's like, well, they knew me or I knew my parents or my grandparents or my cousins. Um. And and I think in in small towns, I mean, um, I mean, there is that 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 strength of kind of personal relationships. Um, and I think we should we should not be bashful about about leveraging those personal relationships uh, to 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 benefit kind of our our professional work. Um, but I, I also see uh, a few people um, in the jam boards talked about how that 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 kind of insular nature of small towns uh, can also be a hindrance, uh, especially if you're coming into a small town from outside. Um, so a few people here are saying, uh, I'm not originally from this small town and I'm considered an outsider. Um, someone else says, even after working here for nine years, I'm still con considered an outsider. Um, and so I'd love to hear uh, anyone who's on the call, like if if you're not from the place where you work, um, uh, any any kind of uh, lessons learned um, in terms of um, building up that kind of um, yeah legitimacy, authenticity, really really being seen as kind of a genuine member of the community. Um, if if um, if uh, a lot of the people in that place have lived there their whole lives, and yeah, in um, any 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 thoughts on that question um, from anyone? And Leah, if I'm not mistaken, you're not originally from Paducah, so I don't know if this is something you've had to to deal with yourself. But if anyone else has, would love to invite others to share uh, as well. Yeah, I I married into this community, and I've been here for 15 years, and um, I feel um, like I grew up in a much larger city and I felt like that was too small of a town for me at that time when I moved away. But then I, I moved here and I just now just love living in a small town. I love that I can tell you like everybody I run into, I can tell you their whole family's names, you know, it's just kind of nice. And, it, and you know, that's exaggerating a little bit because we do have people moving here and leaving all the time, but um, just, having the majority of the people in the community um, be people you know is is kind of nice for me at this point in my life. Yeah, that's great and and would love to 
yeah, just see if others have had kind of similar experiences or yeah, lessons learned from navigating that. Um, uh, or any other issues we have about uh, 10 more minutes. So if there's if there's other other directions you'd like to take the conversation, the floor uh, is open. Hi, my name is Joyce Baker and I'm from Coolidge, Arizona. And um, I've worked here for 11 years and the small town challenge is a huge issue for me. I commute from a suburb 45 minutes away. I don't mind the commute, um, but there are people in town that in spite of my faithfulness for 11 years still will not accept me as being loyal to the community. Um, and, and it hurts, it's hard. Um, but some of the things that I've tried to do to, to show my loyalty is, um, for example, prior to COVID, I would go to city council meetings, even though I, there was no need for me to be there, just to give that visual presence to the city council that I was interested in what was happening in the community. Um, I've joined the Rotary Club. Um, and I also try to make sure that either a other staff member or I participate in um, community networking events. So I haven't found the answer, but I'm not willing to give up either. And it, and it is hard, especially as a shy person, it's very, very difficult coming into a community and not being accepted no matter what you do. And I just have to remember the people who do accept accept me and work with those people and let the people that don't want to work with me, you know, maybe I can have another staff member from the community partner with them. I want to say I really hope it gets better for you. I feel like I, I did experience that when I first moved here. I didn't, I had trouble finding a job. I didn't think um, I would find a job for the first six months I lived here because um, you really just had to know, people had to know you. And I think it took, honestly took six months of me being here to even know, to like say that I knew somebody in the community um, in order to finally make a connection and get the job at the library, so. One other comment about that also is, I have to remind myself that you never know who's related to who. So be very, very careful what you say offhanded because you may offend someone when you don't even realize you're doing it. Noah, yeah. can you hear me? Yep, yep, I can. Okay. So um, I'm Winongwa, I'm from Polk County Libraries and Joyce, I definitely can, can sympathize with what you're saying, but I also would say you're definitely on the right track and you're right about not giving up. Um, it's interesting that the community that I'm in here, I've been since I was eight years old and I think of myself as a native now, but I'm not actually. And my mom was ooh, probably in her forties when she, when we moved here, people think of her as a native now, because I think the two biggest things that she did was she likes to get to know people, which is obviously hard, harder for people who are shy would be harder for me. Um, but the, um, the, the way that she will go to get to know people is by volunteering. And I think where you're saying you're having to commute in, that probably makes it harder because it probably makes it harder for you to do stuff outside of work. But any way that, like you say, not just not just even going to the meetings, but any way that you can involve yourself in people's lives through volunteering or anything like that, it is just another way to build friendships. Because that's what building relationships is, is you're trying to build friendships that you can then um, use to, to be useful to your professional stuff, the library stuff, whatever. So I'd say you're definitely on the right track and don't get discouraged. And some people are just not ever going to be okay with it. And there, you just have to be like, okay, bless your heart, have someone else contact them. <laughs> so you're right on that.
Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, thanks to you both for for sharing. Uh, that's that's really really interesting, and and I I would definitely definitely agree. And and I'll never forget um, uh, uh, about a, a decade ago, I was doing a project in a small town in Illinois, um, and was working closely with a, a particular individual. Um, and some other people in the community said, uh, "Don't don't work too closely with that guy. He's not really from this community. He's only been here since 1970." And I'm like. <laughs> it's like, how long do you have to be be in a in a place before you're seen as kind of a, a an authentic member of the community? And and um and I think in some places the answer is uh, I don't know so so far so many generations that uh, that people can't recall. And so it it is difficult, but but also just um yeah so so don't don't uh, don't get discouraged and and kind of um and also recognize uh, I, I i try to remind myself that uh, there's also a lot of value even though it can be somewhat uh, discouraging from an outsider perspective they're just um uh, recognizing the value that does come from that kind of um strong uh, sense of place and belonging that we we see in so many so many small towns um um but uh but yeah yeah best of luck joyce for sure um yeah um and and yeah we have uh we have a few minutes left um i feel like we we've covered uh, a huge amount of territory today uh just just a quick reminder um that uh we will be uh, uh posting the recording so uh, as well as sharing kind of what was shared in the jamboard so you'll you'll be able to get kind of a, a snapshot of what you see here uh in the jamboard will be sent to you um uh, by email um, on Monday of next week. Um, uh, but I uh, just want to take a moment. We have a couple minutes left. Um, any any final thoughts uh, people want to share with us, uh, Leah um, or, or anyone else um, before we break for today? I don't. Thank you. It has been great. Yeah, thank, thanks, Leah. Um, and and kind of uh, not seeing anything immediately. Um, I'll go ahead and and thank everyone for your time today. Uh, as as you all pointed pointed out in the jam board, when you work in in rural rural and small town libraries, uh, time is very precious. Um, uh, and so I just wanna wanna share with everyone. Uh, I'm so appreciative of you taking the time uh, out of your busy days uh, for this conversation. Um, I hope uh, you found it useful in some way um, and uh, want to thank you again um, and good luck with uh, with all the work that you're doing. Uh, as I often say, everything that I do um, is really a reflection of the great work that you're doing. Um, so keep up the great work, uh, stay in touch um, and, and keep sharing because uh, I think the relationships that we form both uh, amongst ourselves uh, as well as in our community is those relationships that sustain us, uh, sustain our communities and, and sustain our profession. Um, so uh, yeah, and Jordan, uh, thank you so much. Jordan, a graduate student here at UNCG, uh, <laughs> helpfully reminded me, you can also continue the conversation in our event Padlet. Uh, folks have been adding to that Padlet uh, additional resources, questions, thoughts. Um, so that's a space to kind of turn to outside of our uh, official conversations to, to keep the conversation going. Um, so thank you again uh, for your time, um, and I hopefully we'll see some of you uh, next week at our at our culminating event. Um, but uh, also feel free to reach out to me directly at any point. Um, Want to thank everyone for your your time and and Leah uh, and April in particular. Uh, so have a have a great rest of your day, um, and uh, yeah, look forward to hopefully seeing uh, many of you again. Have a good afternoon. Bye.